Hi, I'm Ted Clifton of Clifton View Homes and Zero Energy Plans. We've been operating on Whidbey Island building fine custom and luxury homes for about 24 years. We started Zero Energy Plans as a design company about 2008. We've been designing and building the most energy efficient homes in the world right here on Whidbey Island. This video is going to show you how we do it with the 12 essential steps to net zero. Step number one is building orientation. The ridge line needs to run east-west so that you have a south-facing roof slope. The roof slope is important to give you enough room for solar panels to power the house when you're done with all the other steps. The south-facing wall is the best place for windows that can gather the sun in the winter time and yet the overhangs and covered porches in this house will stop excessive sun from coming in and overheating the house in the summertime. The second step to a successful net zero home is a simple design. This house is nearly square between its four corners and almost a cube because of its height. That limits the exterior surface area, surface area being your enemy both for energy loss as well as for cost. So if we can keep the cost down, we can put additional features providing the energy that you need or limiting energy use in your heating system. So in this house, we've kept a very simple design, lots of open space, and the closet walls, for example, behind me over here are only five feet tall at the back of the closet. That's the north wall of the house, the wall that's gonna lose the most energy in the winter nighttime. So keep that wall small. We limit the heat loss and we limit the cost. So the third step to net zero is correct window orientation. In this house, most of our windows are facing south. We have limited the number of windows facing east or west and almost no windows facing north. We're still getting direct sunlight into every room in the house, but most of that light is coming from the south side of the house where we have the opportunity to use it to warm the house in the wintertime. And our overhangs are properly sized to limit what comes in in the summertime. The fourth step to net zero, and one of the most important, is having the correct thermal mass in a house. In this case, we've used thermal mass floor on our main level. We've used thermal mass concrete countertops in our kitchen. The combination of these gives us enough heat storage that we can warm with the sun during the day and the house will still be warm all night long. And instead of the sun overheating the house in the summertime, it simply stores that excess heat in the floor to be radiated back into the room overnight. And on the coldest day of the year, we might only experience a degree or two of temperature loss from day to night. We could shut the heating system off, have a power outage, some other thing that causes the heat system not to run and you only lose a degree or two a day. Some of our homes, we even put a thermal mass slab on the second floor to get the best performance out of the house. The fifth step to building a successful net zero energy home is to limit air leakage. Build a tight envelope. We use SIPS panel construction, which is a foam core with OSB on both sides. These panels are made up to eight feet by 24 feet in a single panel so we can have an entire wall with the windows pre-cut out. It assembles really quickly, but there's very few joints that need to be sealed. We seal those joints very carefully, and instead of losing up to 30% of our energy due to air leakage, we might lose one or 2%. A tight house is an efficient house. So the sixth step to net zero is to balance your insulation levels throughout the home. Having great insulation in the roof, but not so much in the walls is not cost effective. Having great insulation in the roof and the walls and having a code minimum window doesn't make any sense. We use an R5 window, which is a U value of 0.2. By bringing the window up as close as we possibly can with modern technology to what our walls and our ceilings would be, we save more energy than if we just added more insulation to the lid. We've done energy modeling that shows that the closer you can get the walls and the lid to each other, instead of having, say, R49 in the lid and R21 in the walls, go to R32 and R38, you'll save 14% on your energy. Balance your insulation levels as much as you can. In a tight home, ventilation is really important. And even more important is to balance your ventilation. So instead of trying to suck air out of the house with bath fans or kitchen fans and have no place for air to come back in, we actually provide a powered HEPA filter, which filters the incoming air, as well as providing the power to balance against your range hood fan. So the key to balancing these two fans is we don't use the fan that came with the hood. 
we put our own kitchen fan in place that matches the CFMs provided by the HEPA filter fan. So now we're matching the input and the output and in this case the fan is actually mounted outside so when we turn on the kitchen exhaust we don't actually hear the fan run. We only hear the air move. Much more pleasant. The key to heating and cooling efficiency once you have the envelope right is what kind of equipment you're using for heating and cooling. In this case it's a ground source heat pump. This piece of equipment is about 450 percent efficient on a year-round average in this location. It takes water circulates it through the ground, drawing heat out of that roughly 50 degree ground, and then extracts the heat from that, bumps it up to about 125 degrees with a compressor. It is much less costly to move heat from one thing to another than it is to create heat, as in burning a fossil fuel. So we take that 125 degree water, we use that to heat our domestic hot water, as well as to heat the in-floor radiant heat in the rest of the house. The ninth step to energy efficient construction is your domestic hot water. This tank here actually draws hot water from the ground source heat pump, runs it through the coils in the bottom to heat the water that's in the tank, which is the water that you use to shower. If we didn't have a ground source heat pump, we could use this same tank with a solar collector on the roof and use solar energy to heat our domestic hot water. On the other side of the wall behind me, there's a second tank that's just a regular electric tank type water heater. That heater is used just to store the hot water once it has been heated up. It uses very little energy to keep that water at that temperature. This is the one that does all the work. Step number 10 in the pursuit of a net zero energy home is efficient appliances. Energy Star is a good place to start, but Energy Star only requires that the appliance be 15% more efficient than the standard. In this case, we found a refrigerator that's right at the bottom of the scale for its size and class of appliance. In this size of refrigerator, we could actually be Energy Star and use $77 a year in energy. That's not good enough. We've got to go beyond that and find the most efficient appliance in its category. This refrigerator costs no more than the other. It has all the bells and whistles, all the features. It's a beautiful refrigerator, but it uses less energy. Shop for your appliances carefully. Efficient lighting is step number 11 towards net zero energy. Remember that you're trying to light surfaces, not spaces. So here we're lighting the surface that you're working on, the kitchen sink in this case. So have at least fluorescent or compact fluorescent bulbs in all of your lighting, but the lights that are on the most during the day, in this case, the kitchen lights, are LED lights. They use even less energy than the compact fluorescents and have really a nice tone to them. They're worth spending that little bit of extra money up front in the last 20 years or more. So you'll never be replacing bulbs and they're the most efficient light you can buy today. When most people think of a zero energy home, they think of solar panels on the roof. That's actually the last thing you do. If you haven't done the first 11 steps correctly, you'll never get to net zero. There isn't enough roof on most houses to put enough solar panels to get to net zero. But by doing the first 11 steps correctly, then the 12th step, adding solar panels, the production meter, putting energy back into the grid when you produce excess energy, then you draw from the grid at night or in the winter time when you're not producing enough. By using the right amount of solar panels, over the course of the year, you'll be net zero. If you also want to power your car, we can put additional solar panels on the roof and power an electric car off of the roof of your house. That's what we call a positive energy home. This house is one of those. I hope you've enjoyed our 12 steps to net zero. For more information, you can either visit our Zero Energy Plans website at www.zero-energyplans.com or come to our Clifton View Homes website, cliftonviewhomes.com. Thank you very much.